on singing 272, first and second verses. Brother Ham, come lead us. I'm on the winning side, 272, lifted up on that first verse. Once I drifted out in sin on that first now. Once I drifted out in sin, had no hope, no joy within, and my soul was burning down with pride. Then my Savior came along, and he showed me I was wrong. Now I know I'm on the winning side. Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've been listed in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Well, praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. Turn around with a smile now and shake your neighbor's hand. Verse number three, verse number three in your songbooks, 272. I like the word win, amen. We're on the winning side. Brother Ham, come lead. I will never have a fear on that last. I will never have a fear for my Lord is ever near. And in him so often I confide. He's the keeper of my soul since I gave him full control. And he placed me on the winning side. Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight. For the cause of truth and right, praise the Lord, I'm on the winning. Again on that chorus, well, I'm on the winning. Sing it. Even out in sin, no more will I abide. I've been listening for the cause of truth and right. Well, praise the Lord. And uh, preaching to a few of those folks over there. And uh, nice church, like it. 
and uh, they've got some folks that are a little bit on the lunatic side like some of you. So I felt like I was at home, and uh, it's nothing like home. Glad to be with you. Our memory verse, we've kind of, the last two weeks digressed. We're doing a memory verse every week here as a church family. We're on Psalms 23.3. Psalms 23.3, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now I want you to notice, restoreth my soul. You know, your soul gets sick sometimes. Sometimes you and don't don't take offense to this. Sometimes you get mentally ill. Mental illness is not what you think is illness. You look what illness look up illness. It means out of order, not healthy, unhealthy. And sometimes you just can't think right. You ever been there? I mean, okay, I'll prove it to you. Sometimes you think God's forsaken you. You're not thinking right. Sometimes you think, and, and, and some of you have come to this church, nobody loves me. You're not thinking right. That's called mental illness. And then we make decisions mentally ill. Now there's mental illness that just goes a little deeper and farther and so forth, but, but restoreth my soul. You need spiritual food. And uh, I fed my body three times today. I don't know how many times you fed your, how many times you fed your body today two times but I saw the last one and that was worth about two other times and yet we starve our souls how, how, how come so much church well, how come so many meals we need this tonight I'm glad you're here and let's pray father thank you that you can restore our soul sometimes we just get empty emotionally mentally physically and spiritually Lord, may this be a battery charge for us. Now, everybody here has got a different situation, different circumstance. Somebody here, maybe more than somebody, has a heavy burden. But they chose to come to the house of God, and I'm glad. And I pray you'll encourage them. And I pray you'll build their faith. And I thank you, Lord, that you can work it out, and you can make a way. Meet with us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Patch Club, you can be dismissed. You can be seated. Get your songbooks as Patch Club kids are leaving. 219, 219. In your songbooks, 219. I love this. I love them all, but this one's one of my favorite. 219, first and fourth verses, brother. 219, little as much when God is in it. Lift it up on that first. In the harvest felt now ripened, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you lift it up a little is much when god is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in jesus name when the conflict when the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run he will say if we are faithful welcome home my child well done little is much when god is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in jesus name these announcements please dunamis club that's the club on sunday uh, at 5 30 and a good time good for our kids and uh but the dues are due this month five dollars per person per year that's a good deal any way you slice it and for what they get it's tremendous uh be, please pay those monies to brother or mrs green lee uh i mentioned about something we're starting here it's called the food bank and i gave you ways that you could put in that food bank i met with some, with some, some guys and uh, we come up with much better than what i told you I, i'm just too dumb to pastor really but is what it is. We have these envelopes. You, why, why don't we do this? You can put cash or a check. Uh, if you do go buy a gift card, a Visa gift card, that they charge you three to five dollars for that. Um, and so, since it's secure in this, you can just you find these out in the vestibule, and you want to help uh, our food bank. And we have our bus routes, and we have ladies that'll take those monies 
go buy the food and take it to those families. And I appreciate those ladies for stepping up and doing that. That, that means a lot. And so we, you can put either cash or a check, make it out MOBC, and uh, that'll be that'll just simplify it all the way around. And Brother McKnight, it's got to be in this, though, so Brother McKnight will know uh, where to designate it. And uh, this is a good way for you to feed some families. And we're, and we're finding people. If you're like I am, I, I get I get a little furious when people that uh, don't work, won't work, eat better than I do, and it bothers you as well. And uh, these are we know these families are going to them. They are struggling, and, and, and most will have children, and uh, uh, in most cases of children that are involved, or somebody maybe that's getting off the getting getting off the mat. They've been knocked down. And they're getting off the mat, and you know we have a lot of folks that are that are doing that here, and so uh, it, it'll that'll be a blessing, and uh, so help us out with that, and uh, I think you'll you'll be satisfied with where it's going. So many people want to give, they want to give, and they don't know where to give it, and uh, and so uh, uh, here's a chance that you know where it's going to. I make this announcement ever so often, but but you can't give cash to somebody out on the street wanting money. 99.9% uh, are not going to use it for food. Uh, just That's just the way it is. And if you keep giving them cash, they're never going to improve. They're never going get to out, get out of that mess. And so uh, here's a way that you can do something. And if you know somebody doesn't go to church and you ask them, say, do you like feeding hungry people that are hungry? Oh, yeah. Well, you give me $50 and I'll make sure it gets there. Now, you make sure it gets to us, by the way. But uh, uh, anyway, that's, that, uh, uh, that's a good way for us to help some people. Uh, soul winning tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. Soul winning tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. And we may alter that time a little bit as, as the time changes. Are they going to change the time again this year? I think it is going to be brought back again this year. Is, yeah, okay. I think uh, eventually that's going to stop. Uh, thanks again for Sunday. Uh, so many hands on deck and so many good things happened this last Sunday. And uh, folks saved and baptized. Just a good day. And visitors, just exciting. And already have folks that got saved last week, called about getting baptized this week. So that's exciting, Brother Ham. That, if everybody, everybody's a part of it. And uh, so, many, so many bus drivers and bus workers, uh, they have nine children. I think eight will be with them. And uh, we met them at camp. Uh, he pastored in a church in Virginia, came over to camp, met him. He uh, retired, resigned from that pastorate. Now he's uh, a missionary, and so he'll be with us October the 9th. And uh, so praise the Lord. Now, now, we were having a hard time finding a place for them to stay. You got 11. That means you need three hotel rooms. And the church clerk said, we ain't paying for three hotel rooms. I said, okay, what about we put three tents in the parking lot here? He said, that's fine with me. He said, but we're not, you know, he, I'm kidding. He didn't say that. But we, we can't find a hotel in October because Keeneland's in. And football season and so forth. And so, boy, praise the Lord. Circle C Baptist Ranch is in transition. Brother Smith is now traveling as an evangelist. He's no longer over the camp. I called him, man, can we use the camp, man? He said, yeah, but I'm, I'm not doing it. And uh, who do I call? You got to call Brother Fugit. Well, I didn't want to call Brother Fugit. He's busy, big church, and I didn't want to bug him. And then last week was church growth, so I didn't call him. So I called him Monday on the way to Virginia, and I started it out by bragging about him, telling him what a great man he was. <laughs> My best friends in all the world. Yeah, I mean, I buttered him up, and uh, and most of it was true. And uh, but no, he graciously said, "Oh yeah, yeah, preacher, you can use the camp. Praise the Lord!" And so that they're going to allow us to let them stay over there, just a minimal cost. So praise God, and uh, because otherwise it, we 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 would not allow their children to come. They'd had to leave them at the kennel, and. Uh, you got eight kids. Who's going to babysit eight kids? And uh, so anyway, that's exciting. And appreciate Circle C, brother. If you could allow them to do that, so they'll be here October ninth. It's going to be a great weekend. You're going to want to be here for that and meet them. Great family and uh, uh, be here for that. Uh, Fall festival is October twenty second, and uh, we also have a big day the next day, Pumpkin Sunday. So that's a great big weekend. Please sign up to help us with the fall festival. Uh, that's a fun time. Uh, your children have them wear Bible characters. Uh, costumes or vacation Bible school. There's always awards for the girl, the best bo girl, best boy costume, and uh, um, and so uh, we're we'll gonna do that again this year. Uh, if your child still can fit in the two right over here, and uh, and one right back here, and all right, and one right back here. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Once you receive your card, you can be seated and uh, fill that out, and put it in the offering plate. 
uh, here in just a little bit. Appreciate you being with us tonight, Mount Olivet Baptist Church. All right, get your songbooks 491 and your songbooks 491. Boy, do we not need a shelter. And I'm sure in Florida, they are hunkering down. And so pray for those folks in Florida. What a storm. Unbelievable. And uh, I'm glad I'm here. 491, first and third verses. Brother Hand. 491, a shelter in the time of storm. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide. On that verse of 491. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. On the third as the last, the raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Let us pray. Father, I thank you. You are a shelter. You are a refuge. You are a high tower. You're our buckler. You're a shield. You're our strength. We go on and on. Thank you that you're all we need in this life to feel safe. And Lord, I pray you'd bless those folks in Florida tonight. I doubt there's one church open tonight. And maybe many closed on even Sunday. So I pray you bless, give wisdom to the governor and the folks there, and uh, protect, please. And Lord, bless this offering. Lord, thank you that our doors are open. Thank you for uh, the many if, uh, out soul winning today, and uh, just a good group, a good spirit. Thank you for what you did, the seeds planted. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Now, we're going to be in Daniel and Proverbs, but we're going to read these verses in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Look at your church calendar. A lot of good stuff coming up. Got our old-fashioned Sunday. Got God and Country Sunday. Special Thanksgiving service. And just uh, hard to believe we've got about three months to go in this year. It's been a good year. Let's end strong. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, I'll, I'm going to stop and say this also, you know really life is about a balance. Now, it, it, w it wouldn't be good for Christians to go to church every day, 365 days a year. Number one, we'd get tired of each other. 
but it, it's it, it balance. You got some that just they overload on on one side and they don't have no they're, they're balance balance. I, I don't think we take time to be grateful enough. I don't think we have time to take time to mourn enough, and I don't think we take time to rejoice enough. Those three things we ought to take time to do all three of those, and uh, I encourage you to learn to do that and. Remember it and remind yourself. Notice verse number 23. Let us hold fast, firm, the profession of our faith without wavering or without flinching, without vacillating. Uh, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another, I love this, to provoke unto love and, un and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves some is but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the Wednesday night Bible study. I, I thank you in this generation, in this, this time uh, in the life of our country. There's so many things to do, so much to do, that people come to church on a Wednesday night. It's, it's refreshing. It's encouraging. And may you charge our batteries tonight, encourage us tonight. Lord, for that one who, spiritually speaking, just barely crawled in here, or maybe emotionally they're under it, would you undergird them and strengthen them and help them? We all got a lot going on. We need you. Help us to focus on what you have for us tonight. In Jesus, your name we pray. Amen. Some people say the money for the hard times that shall come. Planning for the future of their daughters and sons. But when life down here on earth is through and we face the judgment throne. The only thing that matters is if to him your soul belongs. The only thing that matters is if you've been born again. Has the blood been applied? Are you forgiven of your sin? And when he opens up the book of life, into your heart he steps. The only thing that matters is if your name is written there. In this modern age we live in, many seek for worldly gain they lay up earthly treasures and live for wealth and fame but if they would only realize when you die it's all in vain the only thing that matters as if he knows your name the only thing that matters is if you've been born again has the blood been applied are you forgiven of your sins and when he opens up the book of life into your heart he steps the only thing that matters is if your name is written there and when he opens up the book of life into your heart he steps The only thing that matters is 
as if your name is written there. Take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. I was reminded by a video on Sunday night by a certain family that I forgot to announce who won the most riders on Sunday. And uh, it was bus 66 had the most riders. And uh, the, the, the Elliott family sent me a video and let me know that the girls in the Elliott family weren't too happy that Brother Walker forgot to announce the winners. I meant to send you a video, and I just got busy, and I, I didn't do it. I was going to, and, and apologize to the girls, and so I guess I owe them a McDonald's out or something. <laughs> do they like McDonald's? They do like McDonald's, all right. Miss Walker, we'll have to take them McDonald's. Miss Walker doesn't like McDonald's, but you can go, and we'll let you drink unsweet tea and uh, with your natural sweetener. And... Uh, She's been on this health kick since she got cancer, and it's about to kill me. And <laughs> Daniel 1, as the day approaches, notice we read that in Hebrews chapter 10. As the day approaches, what day is that? I think the day of the rapture, the, the day of uh, some unbelievable events. Does it mean we quit living because we think we're in the last days? Now, you don't know when that time's going to be. Nobody does. And it's not time for doom and gloom. I'm weary of doom and gloomers. I'm weary of, you see how many kids we have around here? They got a life to live. And uh, it, doom and gloom, Jesus comes and gets us. That's, that's going to be a good day right there. You know, in fact, I'm thinking about just charging everything and having a big debt, and then boom, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm kidding about that. But in the times we live, we need wisdom. We've been talking in the book of Proverbs. Is there a time you don't need wisdom? It's the principal thing the Bible says for the believer is wisdom. That, that ability to see from God's perspective. And I remind you, Proverbs defines how God sees you. Whether you're wicked or righteous, you mark it down. You, you read in the Proverbs, and we're coming up to a time in Proverbs 10 through Proverbs 29. It's moral virtues with the contrast. It shows righteous and wicked. It's really clear. Since the Bible's eternal and God's always been, it's not personal. God's not picking on you. And it's black and white. You're either wise or a fool. You're either lazy or diligent. You either hate or you love. You see that contrast in Proverbs chapter 10. That's why there's a lot of just one line, one statement, and it stands alone. And it's within the one statement, there's a contrast. It says, this is what happens with the wicked, this is what happens with the righteous. What a book. Today, you should have read Proverbs 28. I'd read it once a month, read it through. But you take tomorrow, Proverbs 29, and then do it again. It's, it's so rich. But I wanted to talk about the times in which we live and how somewhat similar they were when Babylon was the world leader, the world empire, and they deported four young men from Jerusalem, from, from, from Israel, and brought them over. The times were similar than they are now. Israel was decimated. God allowed them, and by the way, God allowed them to be deported, and He removed His protection because they neglected the Sabbath. You read your Bible. They ignored the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath then was on Saturday. Now, we change that. We do not have, there's no such thing in the Bible as a Christian Sabbath, but there is the Lord's Day. There's that first day of the week. It used to be holy in America. If you're under 40 years of age, you don't remember that, but I'm old enough to remember that the only people out driving around was going to church. Nothing open. No restaurants open. Pharmacies are open. Fire department open. Hospitals. But that was it. If you wanted gasoline, you better got it on Saturday. In fact, my father-in-law was so strict about it up to the time he died in 2014. He was 84. He didn't buy anything on Sunday. Now, he didn't buy gasoline on Sunday. He didn't buy a newspaper on Sunday. It was just an old school. You say, well, that's just, you know, that, that's just old-fashioned. Don't you think we may need a little bit of that again? 
I mean, last time I checked, this is a dysfunctional world filled with drama and unhappiness and depression. And maybe some of that old time stuff worked. But either way, they forgot that you need Sunday to remind you. Now, now I know we have a lot of people come to churches on Sunday. They never read their Bible Monday through Saturday. That's a real problem. Because right from the church pew, people are being deceived. If you don't know the truth, it's going to, you're going to get deceived. You're going to watch the news, they'll deceive you. A liar will tell you a lie long enough, you'll believe it. But if you get the truth, you'll understand it. Well, in Daniel, we see similar times that we're enduring right now. Israel had neglected the Sabbath. They had neglected the house of God. Watch this. They neglected the words of God. Notice verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Now, that's a very important name right there. Came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, unto his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels unto the treasure house of his God. You've got to understand in context, who is this King Jehoiakim? Who is he? He was wicked, that's who he was. You know why he was wicked? Take your Bibles, hold your thumb there, turn over to Jeremiah chapter 36. Turn back in your Bibles to Jeremiah 36. There's a book by Al Lacey, and he's a big King James Bible man. Can you trust your Bible? And I've lent it out to somebody, and I'm going to order some copies, and it's, it's one of the best on, on why, why I, he's convinced me why the King James Bible is the word preserved, inspired word of God. And he talks about this Jehoiakim. Now, I want you to notice in Jeremiah 36, verse number 20. And they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elishama, the scribe, the roll, the word of God is what it was, and told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elishama, the scribe's chamber. Now you know the, you know the scribe is, it's, it's, it's those who would write down the, the word of God. And those who were versed, they, 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 were, they were, so you know what it is. And Jehodiah read it in the ears of the king. He's reading the Bible to him. And in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. It'd be a good idea as we just take the Bible up to the White House and uh, read it to Joe Biden and all his advisors. Of course, Joe Biden wouldn't know what's going on, but would you read it anyway? Read it to him anyway. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Or go to Frankfurt and get uh, Mr. Bashir and all of his, all the leaders there and just read the Bible. Take a session in one hour, just read the Bible to them. Now you got separation of church and state. Where's that in the Constitution, by the way? Let me remind you, the state doesn't have a problem taking church people's money or tax money. And then they want to tell us to keep our nose out of their business. The only, the only thing that, that's, that's right about separation of church and state is the state needs to keep their nose out of the church's business. Don't you forget that. We ought to have some say what goes on in our gut. We, we, we're, we've lost our minds, you all. And I'm, I'm going to get off subject here, so look, y'all don't misbehave. I'll get off subject. And I'm, I'm, in, and I'm in a good mood tonight, and I'm going to get in a bad mood, and I don't want to do that. I haven't been home for three days. And, and, uh, uh, all right, anyway, verse 20. And they went into the king into the court, but they laid up the roll. So I read that. Look in verse number 22. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. You do that to the Word of God, nothing but bad can come from it. Now you understand, this is the same man that when the, the city was besieged, he was taken, he became a vassal king. He was a puppet in the hand of, of Nebuchadnezzar. He, was, he had no power, he had no clout, and the country was absolutely deported, and they started this, this captivity for 70 years. You can't tell me, not only neglecting, not only neglecting 
the, the, the Sabbath day, then neglected the Word of God. Is there some noise out, outside that, that door, Brother, Brother Ham? Would you go help me out? Just tell them to go down the hall with, with me, please. Tell them to take the kids down the hall. I don't know what the problem is, but I can hear it up to here. So. Now I want you to take your Bibles and turn back to Daniel chapter number 1. Daniel chapter 1. I want to show you, how, and I don't know if we'll get to Proverbs tonight, but I want to show you how the need for wisdom has never been greater. But I want to show you the times and how they're similar to our times. So we have a king that did not consider, in fact rejected the word of God, which made Israel a great nation. What has made America a great nation? The Word of God. The principles of the Word of God. And governments removed it from the schools. Government was never meant to run schools anyway. Bro Brother Meese taught me that. He said, Brother Walker, you've got to understand, the late 1800s, the government wanted to take over schools and communities through a fit. Families threw a fit. They said, no, 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 no. Our community, our families, and our churches will educate our children. Now we've turned them over to the government. The government wants to own our churches, our businesses. Anybody here start a business? Would you raise your hand or run a business? Anybody here? You got to start a business. Well, you know to do that, you got to go through some hoops with the government. They'll make a crook out of it because it's so stupid what you, they make you go through to run a business. They want to run the businesses. They want to run the banks. That's coming. They want to. They want to control the banks. Go to some of the socialist countries, they control the banks. They want to control the schools. They, they already control the universities. They want to control it. They, they control your property. How many homeowners in here? Would you raise your hand? You ought to put your hand down. You don't own it. You pay property tax. If you don't pay your property tax, by law, they can take your property. That's dumb. Why in the world would only property owners have to pay property tax? People that rent should have to pay rent tax. Do you not see what that is? They can come in and take our land. What do you think the communists do? But do you know how we got here? We got here because we, we left the house of God and we left the word of God. That's how we got here. Now, we don't have to do that. We don't have to drink the Kool-Aid. And I'm not going to. This church is important. And I'm going to tell you, I made a vow to you and I make it again. We're not going to close these doors ever again. Now, we may have some kind of parasite come through and nobody can come, but I'll be here. If you want to come, whatever you do, you, but I'm not doing that again. Three weeks into that, that virus thing, and I was fed up. I mean, some churches, Brother Clay's Mill was one of them. The governor sent little spies over there to see if they was opening up. Yeah. Wow. You've got to be kidding me. We had people, we were coming out of church one Sunday morning after we opened up, Brother McKnight. You all didn't know this because I didn't say anything about it. But there were some people that were ridiculing our people walking back to their cars and telling them that you all are killing people for going to church. What? I'm simply saying, we, we, you'll see the similarities here. So what, what's it mean? We throw up our hand. No, 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 no. We dig in. We get wisdom. We win souls. We live right. We do right. We rejoice. We mourn when we mourn. We rejoice when we rejoice. We thankful when we should be thankful. We go on and live the Christian life because we ought to live like God's still alive and still be happy. I, I'm going to be happy. And you come in here in a bad mood if you want to. You ain't affecting me with your sourpuss. I'm happy. Am I happy, Miss Walker? See, the boss said I'm happy. I'm happy. We're going we're gonna to be happy. We're, we're going to go on a date Friday. I'm going to enjoy that day. This weekend is, is, is Sunday, and, and you be here, but I'm going to be preaching in Chicago on a Sunday. I, very rarely. It's a, church, a long story, but we're going to have a good trip. I don't want to go. I'd rather be here. I love it here. This is my favorite place to be. I go there every year. It's Brother Mises' dad's church. They have a banquet. It's, it's, it's in the middle of Chicago, and, and go there. But we're going to have a good time. I'm not going to let the world and the intimidators convince me otherwise, but that doesn't mean we cannot face reality. Now notice, if you will, verse number 2. They put, of course, they sliced and diced the word up, the Chicoan did. 
Now they took the, the, the sacred vessels of the, the house of God and they put them in a false house of God. And they took that which was holy and put it in an unholy place. And, and we, we've seen that, how church has been dismissed in, in, society, in, in our society. It's mostly been marginalized as non-essential. Hasn't it? It's non-essential. Just exactly what the Jews did. Now you ought to make it essential in your life. You ought to decide, boy, it is, it, it is essential, it is important. I, I've got to be as faithful as I can or as my, 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 my life divinely guided and provi- uh, allows me to, but you ought to make it sacred. But now wait a minute. To make the house of God sacred and not make the Word of God sacred is betrayal to why God gave us the house of God. If anybody ought to know the Word of God, it ought to be people that go to the house of God. You can read it 15 minutes a day. You can get a thought every day from the Bible and carry it with you all day. One thought, one word, every day. It changed you, I guarantee you that. And by the way, I think God looks down and He says, you know what, I don't have to have a lot to spare America. If I have a remnant that are sold out and a remnant that love me, we're not better than anybody. We're not talking about judging everybody else. We're not talking about going around hitting people over the head with a Bible. We're just talking about living the Bible, living it right, because we're in the same days as we find in Daniel 1. See, our generation wants God's best. We want God's best, but we we don't want to give our best. I want you to notice verse number 3. And the king spake unto Asphanaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. Now, isn't that interesting that this world power wanted the best? Pretty smart guy. He said, I want you to go there and bring me the best. By the way, if you'd have been there, would he have got you? You ever think about that? Would they had to overlook you because of your character? Now, let me remind you, we've got a character crisis in America. We need to teach hard work 101 again. We need to teach working as a team again. And you're not bigger than the team. We need to teach respect for authority again. We're talking about character. We got a, we got, we got a character crisis. You need to teach your children. When an adult speaks to your child, that child ought to speak back. I'm just going to tell you, I'm so shocked how many children come to this church don't speak back. You speak to them. Hey, how you doing? And they just walk by you. That's wrong. You like it, lump it, whatever. That's wrong. What's your child? Your child is so perfect and so, so almighty that they don't speak to somebody? Well, it makes them uncomfortable. That's another thing. I'm sick and tired of these little soft, soft families making a little sissy out of your kids because they don't want to make them do anything that's uncomfortable. That ain't the real world. That is not the real world. Life's uncomfortable. I'm not saying be mean to them, but you're going to have to push them out of that little nest. They got to do something that's uncomfortable. In fact, I think every now and again a child ought to have to eat something they don't like. Man, alive, when I was growing up, brother, they put the food there, you ate it. Now, my mother didn't fix stuff we didn't like on purpose. Oh, I wish you could have seen our daughter Sarah. My wife's rule was this. You're going to try it one time. And once you put it in your mouth, you better not spit it out. I remember that time Philip spit food out. If you see him, you know he's not spitting any food out now. He ain't spitting nothing out now. I'll never forget, I, we, we were in Bible college, and he, remember he spit that food out, and buddy, she called it with a spoon, and she right back in and went. In fact, I think I saw you on the floor scraping it up on the floor and putting it right in. Now, she wouldn't feed it to him again, but I remember Sarah, I don't think she liked green beans. And she was eating them. You know, it took her two hours to you finish that bite. Now, she didn't make them eat it again, but you're going to try it, and once it's in your mouth, you're going to eat it. I'm not saying be cruel. I'm, I'm not, you know what I'm saying. We need character. It's a character problem. They wanted the best. They wanted the best. The world wants the best. Don't they? They do. They want the best. They don't want leftovers. You go to a restaurant, you go to business, you want their best. I go to a hotel, and and, and as I travel a little bit, I I, I don't expect it to be a five-star hotel, but I do expect it to be clean, and I always check for bed bugs. 
No, no, no bed bugs. I like it to be clean. The towels to be clean and nice and straight. I don't care if it's real, real nice or big or fancy. Anything extra, just clean. It's nice. We, we want the best and we give God less than the best. We'll give our business our best. We'll give our favorite recreation our best. If you play sports, you'll give that your best. If you're a hunter, you'll give it your best, and you should. Well, guess what? This king in Babylon, he says, I want your best. And he said, Aphanaz, you go down there and notice what he wanted. The Bible says, we're living like that now. The world wants our best kids. I think it's time God gets some of our best kids. Now, God will take anybody, and will take anybody. I'm not saying there's less or more than the kid that has no talent versus the kid that has a lot of talent but doesn't have the character to work hard. The kid with no talent will work hard enough to get the talent, to get the job done. Now, God can take that kid with the less talent. You get the kid with a lot of talent, also has the work ethic, there's a superstar. Why didn't God get the best? I, I, I'll be honest with you. I shouldn't be in this pulpit. I'm just a goober. I'm dumb. Thank you for those amens. I appreciate that. I'm less than. But you know, sometimes I think, Brother McKnight, God looked down and said, well, Walker will do it. I'll call him. I'm not much, but I can give it all I got. I really think that. I'm not kidding you. I probably should be a Sunday school teacher, maybe a soul winner and all that sort of stuff. And I've thought about this often, but I think God looked down and maybe said, you know what? He'll give all he's got. He ain't much. And he looks around in heaven and he said, these rest of these, these ones that are there at the skill, they, they want, they're not going to do it. So we're going to have to call Walker. I think some angels said, have we gotten to that place, God? Have we been reduced to that? And I think God says, we have. What do you think? Well, surely look around more, God. And God looked around and came back. It's Walker. Oh, go ahead and call him. And he looked at all the angels and said, we're going to have our work cut out for us. Amen. And he put his finger on my heart. The Bible says here, notice in verse 4, or excuse me, verse 3, And the king spake unto Asphanad, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. He said, I want royalty. Your royalty if you got saved. Your royalty. You're in Babylon. We're in Babylon. I never dreamed we'd be in the minority if we were against gay marriage. And we are. I, I, I never dreamed we'd be in the minority we call the transgender mess a mess. I, I never believed we would be called bigots and homophobes if we just think a woman ought to go to a woman's bathroom and a man ought to go to a man's bathroom. And if a man says he's a woman and goes to a woman's bathroom, he may need his brain shot out. Because that's perversion. I, I never dreamed that to say that you're going to get pushed back like you're crazy. We're in Babylon. We're in Babylon. I never dreamed that in the day that we've needed God and church more than ever, crowds are leaving it by the droves. I, I never dreamed we'd be that day. We're in Babylon. That doesn't mean we can't offer God our best. That doesn't mean we can't want our best for our children. This new thing, Brother Ham started brilliant. Bringing these kids up on Wednesday night and singing. And every Wednesday night they're having a music class and learning about God's music and, and who wrote it and the story behind it and the principle behind it and the doctrine of it. And they're getting up and singing. And, and three weeks now, and it's just, I, I, I look forward to Wednesday now to hear those kids sing. And I hope we never stop it. I hope it grows. We're in Babylon. But that doesn't mean we've got to act like Babylon. Notice the Bible says, I've got to hurry. Look who he picks. Children in whom was no blemish. And no blemish. Now, now that word blemish, it means, it means soundness physically, socially, emotionally, and mentally. Our new Sunday school theme is Sunday school, the place to grow spiritually first and socially. Don't let your children be social misfits. They may homeschool, Christian school, you want to protect them from this old stinking world, but that doesn't mean isolation to where they're social 
awkwardly and, and they're misfits. They ought to be able to engage people. How are we going to win people if we can't engage people? We can learn that in Sunday school. They learn social skills to be better soul winners. They can go out in society and be able to talk to people in public that they don't know. That's what I'm saying about them learning to be friendly here. We have enough visitors every week. I'd, I'd ask your child, how many people new did you talk to this week that you didn't know before? I, I'd do that. that. That's a good idea. And tell, tell, have them come tell you, how many, how many people did you go up to and say, hi, my name is so-and-so, glad to see you. Reward them, whatever it takes, but you're, they're learning a social skill. What do you think an adult would think? They come to our church and a young man or young lady comes up and says, oh, hi, I've never seen you here before. My name is so-and-so. What do you think that would do for that adult? That encouraged them. That would really encourage them. Well, these had no blemish. They were socially agile. They were emotionally strong. They were mentally well. And they were spiritually strong. Now, he wasn't looking for the spiritual part, but he, he, he was looking for the other. He said no blemish. It, it says that, that they, uh, no deformity, no defects of body or mind. One preacher said they couldn't be ugly. That's when I want you to go down there and say, now don't you bring any ugly ones back. Well, Brother McKnight, that'd rule you out. It'd rule me out. I'd be left back in Judah. Now, I don't know if it necessarily means that, but it does say no blemish. That's what it says. Watch this. Notice what he says. Children in whom is no blemish. See, the world wants this to exploit it. We're living in Babylon. It's not like the world does need an area of life and you'll give it to the devil. And you ought to give it to God. Well, I can make more money if I do that in the world. God will take care of you. You'll live well. You'll be happy. Listen, if you've got to choose wealth or peace, which would you choose? <laughs> Somebody says both. And that's okay, but I'm simply saying, no blemish, notice what else. But well-favored, there's your social skills. Well-favored. That's what that means. social skills. Well-favored. That's what that means. You don't favor somebody that's a jerk, unfriendly, zero personality. Now, I'm not saying you've got to be an extrovert. and some, You can't blame that on, you know, you're just, you're just scared of people. You, you ought to be friendly. You ought to grow into that. But these guys had that. Let, let me ask a question. If they came looking for the best, would they choose you? Man, we're in Babylon. But we are not going to walk to the drumbeat of Babylon. We're going to walk to the drumbeat of the Bible and get the character that God wants us to have and be in the image of Christ, which is well favored. Jesus was a social man. You check Luke 2.52 out. He was favored by God and man. I guarantee you Jesus in a social setting was the best. He didn't, he didn't have to compromise right. He didn't have to compromise purity. He didn't have to compromise a propriety. He was the best. But we're in Babylon, and Babylon wants you, and Babylon wants our kids. Don't mess with God and your children's will for their lives with God. Do not talk them out of it. It's dangerous. God made them for a purpose. He made them for Him. He's got a great life for them. You keep your hands off that other than guiding, loving. They get to be adults. Let God lead them. Notice this. It says, well, favor and skillful in all wisdom. It says all wisdom and cunning in knowledge. As for now, don't go get any dummies. Now, there's nobody that's dumb unless they choose to be. You choose not to learn. You choose not to be instructed. We're in Babylon, and it's so similar. It's not like our world doesn't want cunning people in knowledge and cunning people in worldly wisdom, but it's a shame that some people in the world have more wisdom about finances, more wisdom about socializing, I say socializing, I mean just interacting with people, than God's people. The wisest people in society ought to be God's people. It ought to be God's people. The most loving people in society ought to be God's people. The most welcoming people in society ought to be God's people. The ones with the highest standard, the bar has been lowered so far. But we're in Babylon. And the king says, there's not just anybody come from there. I'll, I'll leave the dead beasts back, but I want you to go find these that are cunning in knowledge. And the Bible goes on to say, in verse number four, in understanding science. 
and such as had ability to them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Those, notice what he says, that they, might, they could learn. Now I want you to notice what, what happens here. They want to change them. We're in Babylon. It wants to change you to its image. I'm amazed that the temple of God, when they built that, it was unbelievable. The expense was incredible. Millions of dollars, probably by our standard, billions of dollars to build a Kent temple. Where's the temple of God today? You. And how sloppy we handle the temple. There's nothing vulgar ought to come out of your mouth. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You shouldn't go in public sloppy. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You represent Jesus everywhere you go, friend. The temple in the Old Testament, millions of dollars, no expense spared, everything just right. Can you imagine what it must have looked like? And then Jesus says in the New Testament, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You've been bought with a price. And we treat it like junk. We, we, it, it's amazing. But I take care of the t- Here, it says they, they could learn. And they was willing to learn. And they wanted to change them and conform them into the image of the Babylonians. They changed their language. They changed their names. And I'm, I'm finished with this point. They took their names, their Hebrew names, which honored God, and gave them their Babylonian Chaldean names, which honored God dead gods Daniel means God is my judge the name they gave him meant Baal protects the king as if Baal was a god and for some reason though we call the three boys Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego we call them by those Chaldean names which we probably shouldn't but it's easier to say them I guess but they all mean honoring a dead god and their Hebrew names honored the living god It's exactly what Babylon America wants to do to God's people. They've changed our language. What does marriage mean? One man, one woman getting married. It's a union between a woman and a man. Go look at a modern dictionary and see what it says. They destroyed the word gay. My wife's middle name's gay. Go to dictionary. What, they, they, they change in our language. Now it's so vulgar and profane. It's pitiful. It's almost a mark of, of, of honor if you can be more vulgar. It's sad, isn't it? Brother McKnight, we're in Babylon. We don't have to act like Babylon. Huh? We don't have to be depressed like Babylon. We don't have to have doom and gloom like Babylon. Some of you are under some burdens right now. You've got the God of glory. God's going to make a way. We may be in Babylon, but guess what? We could be like these three Hebrew boys, four Hebrew boys. That you read that chapter number one, brother, they did not conform to Babylon. In fact, the king eventually conformed to them. Now we need wisdom because we're in Babylon now. And I don't know if it'll get any better, but that doesn't mean we can't win people. This place was filled with people Sunday, they was everywhere. And we got some more to go get this week and fill this place up and love them and tell them the truth. Who knows? God just may perform a bunch of miracles. Because though we may be in Babylon, we didn't come from Babylon, thank God. Let's stand for closing prayer. I'm finished. Father, I thank you for truth. Thank you for your people. Thank you. You have an answer for every generation's problems. Thank you, there's joys to be enjoyed. There's mountains to climb. There's even good fun to be had. Even though we are surrounded by Babylon, it seems. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Could you come tonight? I'm going to point the piano some minutes. Come and just pray for our country. We always close out every Wednesday night just praying around these altars. We've got a couple special prayer requests. Wants to come and pray for Florida. Pray for Beverly Linton. She had surgery, had to go back to the hospital. She struggled a bit, a bit. I haven't heard anything today. And pray for Brother Buffin. He wants to be in church, but so many things going on. And then uh, a special prayer request that's unspoken. Just, uh, just uh, I can't speak it, but unspoken. 
But if anything, come and just pray for our nation. Hey, don't get caught up in the depression of a nation. Don't know what's going to happen. But God's not died. His word is still true. David said it. He's, uh, he's, he's been young and old, and he's not seen the righteous forsake, uh, forsake or st the seed of the righteous starve, forsaken. That's not per you know the perfect quote, but you know what the verse says. So he'll take care of us. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for a crowd of people that love you enough to come on a Wednesday night, a beautiful night. A lot of things could be, do could be doing, but they're here. And I thank you for it. I thank you that you're here. Bless our end of our service around these altars tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The piano will play. You can come around these altars.